Hello and welcome to GM Service Know How. I'm Peter Carey. In this program, we're going to take a look at a completely new all wheel drive system called VersaTrack. This system not only transfers torque from the front axle to the rear axle, but to either or both rear wheels as needed. VersaTrack debuts on the 2001 Aztec, the 2002 Rendezvous, and the 2002 Venture Montana and Silhouette. At the heart of the VersaTrack system is a power transfer case which is mated to the right side of the transmission assembly. A propeller shaft assembly transfers power and torque from the transfer case to the rear differential. The on-demand all-wheel drive rear differential distributes variable torque and power to the rear wheels via individual axle shaft assemblies. Power output is provided independently to each of the rear wheels only when slippage occurs at the front wheels. Now we'll take a closer look at the system's major components, beginning with the transfer case. The transfer case changes power output from transverse to longitudinal and also positions the propeller shaft near the center line of the vehicle. It consists of a four-piece aluminum housing, an input helical gear assembly, also referred to as the carrier, an idler helical gear, and a high-point bevel gear set, which consists of two shaft assemblies that are supported by tapered roller bearings. The transfer case has two drain plugs because two types of lubricants are used. The transfer gear case is lubed with the automatic transmission fluid, while the hypoid bevel gears use a unique synthetic gear lube. Two internal oil seals keep the fluid separate from each other. The rear differential consists of a torque tube assembly, an aluminum housing, a ring and pinion gear set, and a carrier assembly. The carrier assembly contains separate gyrotor type pumps, clutch packs, and axle subshafts for each rear wheel. The check valve is equipped with a temp sensor that monitors sump oil. If the temperature of the differential oil exceeds 230 degrees Fahrenheit, the valve will close, block oil flow to the gyrotor pumps, and illuminate the AWD disable lamp. When front wheel slippage occurs, a rotational speed difference occurs between the gyrotor pump components in the differential carrier assembly. In those instances, the pump draws fluid from the sump and sends fluid to the pistons, which actuates each specific rear wheel clutch pack. If a temporary spare or any wheel of a smaller or larger dimension is used, the wheel rotational speed difference will be detected by the wheel speed sensors of the ABS system. The EBTCM will close the differential check valve to block oil flow to the gyrotor pumps. In both spare wheel usage and over temperature conditions, the check valve will actuate, blocking oil flow and the system will illuminate the AWD disable lamp on the instrument panel. Now let's turn to diagnosis. Be sure to consult the available service information before diagnosing this or any system. Remember that strategy-based diagnostics is your best tool for identifying conditions efficiently and accurately. You may need to road test the vehicle to verify the customer concern. Be sure to note factors such as vehicle speed, road conditions, and ambient temperature. It's also important to inspect the transmission and transfer case for proper fluid level. Also, inspect the entire system for any aftermarket devices which could affect the operation of the vehicle. Now, let's continue with removal and inspection procedures for the transfer case. Any transfer case service requires the removal of the transmission and transfer case from the vehicle as a unit. The transfer case weighs approximately 60 pounds, so be careful when lifting it. As you watch the disassembly procedure, keep in mind that the Aztec transfer case is serviced by exchange for the first six months of introduction. Then it goes to full service. Since the rendezvous will be introduced later than the Aztec, the rendezvous transfer case will be introduced as a full service item. The 2002 Venture, Montana, and Silhouette will also be full service upon introduction. <laughs> 
Begin by removing the output shaft snap ring. After removing the fasteners, remove the side brace and the lower brace bolt if you haven't already done so. Next, remove the transfer case bolts and remove the transfer case assembly from the transmission case. Then position the transfer case in the J44755 holding fixture. To remove the output shaft, you'll need an output shaft remover and a slide hammer. With the hammer attached to the output shaft remover, secure the tool to the output shaft and remove the shaft from the transfer case. Now that the transfer case is removed from the transmission, it can be disassembled using the following procedure. Begin by making sure that the extension housing and the transfer case are fully drained. After removing the vent hose and bracket, remove the speed sensor. The bracket and speed sensor are retained with the same bolt. After removing the speed sensor, inspect the O-ring. It can be reused if it isn't cut or damaged. Then remove the remaining fasteners and the extension housing and shim. Mark or tag the shim for reassembly. To remove the flange, shaft, bearing and spacer, bolt the flange to the J44755 holding fixture. Then remove the nut from the shaft. The flange, spacer, bearing, and shaft can then be removed with a press. Once the shaft is out, remove the oil seal plus the inner and outer bearings and braces if necessary. Next, unfasten the bolts to remove the drive shaft housing, O-ring, and shim from the transfer case. Again, mark the shim for reassembly. The next step is to remove the bolts and separate the case halves. Take care not to damage the case sealing surfaces. Use the pry points that are built into the case. Never insert a screwdriver or prying tool between the two halves. You're now ready to remove the idler gear from the right half of the case. Before removing the gear, note its position. The end of the gear with the longer flange area should be positioned toward the right half of the case. To remove the bearings from the idler gear, you'll need the J22912-01 split plate bearing puller and a press. Next, attach the left half of the case to the holding fixture. Be sure to align the notched area of the tool with the flat areas of the output drive shaft. After removing the nut from the output drive shaft, you're ready to remove the gear, bearing, spacer, and shaft from the left half of the case using a press. Mark or tag these components for reassembly. At this time, the races should be removed from the case. Then the two oil seals. These oil seals should be replaced any time the unit is repaired. You will again use the J22912-01 split plate bearing puller to remove the bearings from the shaft if necessary. After removing the seal and nut, Use a press to separate the carrier from the case. Again, the bearings and races in the case and carrier assembly should be marked for reassembly. If you need to remove the inner carrier bearing, install the J44754 bearing remover and the split plate bearing remover J22912-01. Then use a hydraulic press to remove the bearing. With the transfer case completely disassembled, 
clean the housings in solvent and remove all sealant material from sealing surfaces. Then you're ready to inspect individual components. Make sure that all gasket sealing surfaces are free of nicks and gouges. Inspect the bolt threads and oil seal bores for damage. Check the vent valve and hose assembly for damage or restrictions. Then inspect the gears for wear, pitting, and discoloration caused by heat. Also check the drive and driven shafts for worn gear teeth, a worn or scored shaft, or damage to the splines and threads. Also inspect the seal surface of the drive shaft for wear. Finally, inspect all bearings and races for pitting, scoring, and grooves. Also look for discoloring, which can range from a faint yellow to a blue color. This could be a sign of improper lubrication. Excessive heat can soften the rollers and races. Therefore, discolored bearings or races should be replaced. When reassembling the transfer case, all internal components must be assembled in the original location and direction. Be sure to lubricate the bearing races and oil seals with their appropriate lubricant. Never install the internal components dry. The transfer case is assembled for proper gear clearances and backlash is adjusted with shims. Because the assembly procedure is thoroughly detailed in the service information, we'll concentrate on the various measurements that are needed during the assembly procedure. Let me emphasize that using shims is absolutely critical to customer satisfaction when servicing this system. It's also important to follow all service procedures when performing these operations. Once you've installed the inner and outer bearing races to the extension housing, Use a dial caliper to measure the distance between the flange on the driven shaft and the end of the pinion. Record the dimension. You can think of this value as the thickness of the pinion. Then use a hydraulic press to install the inner bearing onto the driven shaft. And install it and related components into the extension housing as shown in the service information. Be sure to use a new crush sleeve spacer. With the extension housing fully assembled, measure the rotating torque of the driven shaft. A properly assembled shaft and bearings should have a rotational torque of 13 inch pounds or 1.5 newton meters. Next, use a dial caliper and a straight edge to measure the distance between the end of the pinion and the surface of the extension housing. Record the dimension minus the thickness of the straight edge. Think of this value as the pinion height. Then install bearing spacer J44757-3 into the bore of the output drive shaft housing. The service information contains a numerical value that represents one half of the tool diameter. Next, install the J44757-9 to the output drive shaft housing with two bolts. Then use a feeler gauge to measure the distance between the J44757-3 and the J44757-9. Record this dimension as well. Carefully inspect the end of the driven shaft. You'll find either a positive or negative value or a zero stamped on the end. This value and the other measurements you previously recorded are used to determine the thickness of the extension housing shim using the calculation supplied in the service information. When installing the idler gear in the left half of the transfer case, you'll need to determine the thickness of the idler gear bearing shim. To do this, place the J44757-1 on the idler gear and race. Then install the right half of the case using the J44757-8 spacers and bolts. Measure the gap in the J44757-1 using a feeler gauge. This gap is the shim thickness for idler gear bearing. You can now remove the right half of the transfer case and continue assembly procedures according to the service information.
Tools J44757-2, 6, and 8 are used to measure end play to determine the drive shaft shim thickness. J44757-7 is a spacer that creates measurable end play. With the tools installed, rotate the drive shaft several times to make sure the bearing rollers are fully seated against the bearing races. Then attach a dial indicator to the J44757-6 and position the tip of the dial indicator on the end of the J44757-2. Using a hand wrench, rotate the end nut on the J44757-2 to preload the bearings and to position the shaft at the bottom of travel. You'll need a second wrench to hold the shaft. Then zero the dial indicator. Next, loosen the lower nut and tighten the upper nut to preload the bearings and position the shaft at the top end of travel. Take the measured value on the dial indicator and subtract it from the number given in the service information to determine the shim thickness for the drive shaft and bearings. A similar procedure is used to determine the thickness of the carrier bearing preload shim. Install the J44757-4 spacer between the carrier bearings as shown in the service information. Then install J44757-5, 6, and 8 to the right half of the transfer case. Attach the dial indicator to the J44757-6 plate and position the tip of the dial indicator to the end of the J44757-5. Then use a hand wrench to rotate the nut on the J44757-5 to preload the bearings and to position the shaft at the bottom of travel. Zero the dial indicator. Next, loosen the lower nut and tighten the upper nut to preload the bearings and position the shaft at the top end of travel. Take the measured value on the dial indicator and subtract it from the number given in the service information to determine the shim thickness for the carrier and bearings. Before assembling the two halves of the transfer case, you'll need to measure the backlash between the drive shaft and the driven shaft. You must do this before final assembly in order to isolate these two gears from the other gears in the transfer case. Let's look at the procedure. With the output drive and extension housings fully assembled on the left half of the transfer case, install an 8 mm by 1.25 bolt into a threaded hole on the flange. Position the dial indicator against the threaded area of the bolt. Rotate the flange left and right to measure the backlash between the drive and driven shaft gears. Be sure to measure in multiple locations. Correct gear backlash should be between 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters. To check for end play between the transmission and transfer case, install a gauge bar and caliper onto the transmission mounting surface. Then measure the distance from the gauge bar to the top of the sun gear. Subtract the thickness of the gauge bar and record this value as dimension A. After installing the gauge bar and caliper onto the transfer case carrier, measure the distance from the gauge bar to the carrier thrust bearing. Then measure the distance from the gauge bar to the transmission mounting surface. Subtract the distance from the gauge bar to the carrier thrust bearing and record the remainder as dimension B. Subtract dimension B from dimension A to get the correct sun gear selective washer as shown in the service information. One final note regarding the transfer case. Whenever the transmission is overhauled or exchanged, stack up clearances, selective thrust washers and end plays must all be considered and properly adjusted before reattaching the transfer case to the transmission to ensure proper operation. Now, let's move to the rear drive unit.
The propeller shaft is serviced by replacement only. At present, the rear axle and torque tube are considered an assembly and are serviced by exchange only. All seals, however, are serviceable at this time. The system has no diagnostic trouble codes. However, a variety of diagnostic parameters can be obtained with a scan tool. A performance check is an important way to determine if the system is operating properly. Begin by lifting the vehicle high enough for the wheels to rotate freely. Then start the engine and place the transmission in neutral. Using your hands, turn each of the rear wheels in a forward direction. If the all-wheel drive system is operating as it should, the front wheels will also rotate at the same rate. With the engine still running, shift the vehicle into park. Then try to turn each rear wheel again by hand in a forward direction. The amount of resistance should increase the faster you try to turn the rear wheel. This indicates that the differential is working as it should. The complete description of this test is shown in the service information. Finish your diagnosis by checking for proper fluid level at the rear differential fill plug. Like any system or component, Versatrack plays an important part in determining customer enthusiasm for all GM vehicles. It all depends on your ability to accurately diagnose conditions and make efficient repairs. Well, that wraps up this GM service know-how. Be sure to consult the booklet that accompanies this video for further information. The instructions for taking the test are coming up next. For GM Service Operations, I'm Peter Carey. All testing for the GM Service Know-How program is now accomplished through the GM Service Technical College website. The interactive voice response system is no longer active. To receive credit for this course, please access the GM Service Technical College website at www.gmstc.com and select Training Management from the menu. This will take you to the Training Management System. A valid username and password are required for this portion of the site. Once you have been granted access to the system, select the Tests option. From here, you will be presented a list of available tests. Select the test you wish to take and follow the prompts. This testing procedure provides immediate results at the completion of the test and is linked to the GM Service Technical College Training Management System. Your opinions and suggestions are welcome as a way to improve future GM Service know-how releases. A survey form is available at the end of the course test.